The study that I was referencing in the intro video was from a website called Hindawe.com and this is a scientific uh, research journal site that has to do with sharing research statistics through collaboration and openness. Before I go over the results here, I want to preface it by saying that I'm not against surgery or not at least completely against it. However, there's a couple things that stand out to me and I just want to increase awareness so that you can consider all the facts. So let's start off. If you look at this study, you can scroll down to a chart they have that makes this a little more visual, a little easier to understand. So they studied 86 patients and they actually followed up with them after three months to get to the results that we'll get to in a second. And the patients either had one of three symptoms, pain, numbness, and or muscle weakness. And this was due to the lumbar disc herniation. So most people have pain from when they have a herniated disc, very common. Um, one thing I know about herniated disc is they will heal on their own. And when things heal, typically you have a relief in pain. So whether or not you get surgery, a high percentage of people are going to experience relief from pain. Numbness, I personally don't put as much weight on because it's subjective. It's very hard to figure out whether you've recovered from numbness. You kind of get used to it over the time. It's very hard to measure. And, you know, again, it's subjective. However, muscle weakness, that's something that's not nearly as subjective. You can measure that and you can tell by muscle atrophy whether or not something's coming back or not. In my case, I had severe weakness, profound weakness in my calves. I couldn't lift my heels off the floor. I had profound weakness in my hamstring muscles. Pre-injury, I was able to curl 120 pounds 10 to 12 times. After the injury, a few months after, I, I tested my strength and I was barely able to curl 10 pounds for two to three reps. So that's what a 95% decrease. And then my glutes as well. And the only reason I even noticed that I knew I had weakness in the glutes is because they completely atrophied. So my calves, my hamstrings, and my glutes completely atrophied. My glutes, I'll point out, because it was shocking. It was so bad that I couldn't even wear jeans anymore. I had to wear sweatpants because even with the belt, they wouldn't stay up. When you have no glutes and you're just straight as a, a stick, it, it just doesn't work. So if we skip ahead to the results here, and I don't want to spend a lot of time, you can read through this, but here's here's what I think about the results. So we have 86 patients that were studied over a three month follow-up and they reported the relief in extent of pain, numbness, and weakness. Pain was reduced, reported, uh, there was reported uh, a reduction of pain in 82 percent of the patients. You can see that over here. For the numbness, 41 percent improved, uh, reported an improvement or a relief in numbness and as far as muscle weakness, only 21% reported relief in muscle weakness. And then to further um, make my point, if you consider that herniated disc heal on their own, what percentage of this improvement, because if you don't get surgery, most likely you're gonna have a relief in pain, what percentage was really due to the surgery or was was it from the natural the body's natural healing process or was it a result of the rehab that the person did after they got the surgery and the same thing goes for the 41 and the 21 percent 
In my opinion, the rehab is critical and plays a significant role in any of these success. Now on to my injury experience. So back on 11-20, when I had a coughing attack and initial pain, I realized this is probably when I first herniated my disc. And then a month later, when it started to heal and the pain went away, I attempted to do sit-ups. And when I tried to do a sit-up, I do remember having a sharp searing pain in my lumbar area. And I now realize that is probably what is responsible for compressing the nerve root, causing the numbness, muscle weakness, and resulting muscle atrophy that I suffered with thereafter. So, day one. On day one of my injury, which is 12-20-2018, December 20th, I woke up stiff, I got out of bed, and then I immediately sneezed. And when I, this happened, I felt immediate pressure and pain on the lower left side of my back. Again, I thought it was just a recurrence of what had happened a month earlier, and I was kind of annoyed. I'm like, oh, now I have to spend another month waiting for this thing to heal. The next day when I woke up, however, uh, things really took a downturn. So I woke up tight and in extreme pain. I couldn't stand up straight. I couldn't bear weight. And I noticed I had numbness on my right foot, especially on the toes, underneath on the bottom part of the foot, the heel, and then the outer side. And additionally, I noticed that I had numbness and it is hard to pinpoint but along the nerve root moving up and down the calves and I noticed it on the right side and I also noticed my left foot had some slight numbness so I went to the family doctor because I was concerned about the numbness and he prescribed some anti-inflammatory medicine along with muscle relaxers and he felt like it just needs to calm down and then that numbness will go away a few days later, day five on December 24th, 2018, I went and had x-rays done at the hospital. Um, I had initially asked for an MRI, but he felt like they, um, the insurance might not cover that, so that we can go ahead and do x-rays first, and then we won't see anything on that, but that will be justification in order to go ahead and do the MRI. So I went ahead and did the x-rays. The x-rays showed that I had pretty severe arthritis, uh, but it didn't show anything else as expected. By this time, however, though, I could not stand or walk on the balls of my feet anymore. So I was experiencing muscle weakness by then, severe, and I was becoming very concerned. Another thing that I noticed is my feet were unusually cold. The circulation in my feet w was terrible. I actually had to uh, like put a hair dryer on my feet to try to keep them warm and no matter what I did it, 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 my feet just stayed cold. It was terrible and I had significant impairment in my ability to move, move my feet up and down and significant weakness as you can see in the calf muscles and I described it as, as it, it felt like I was walking in ski boots. Two days later, day seven, on December 26th, I sent an email to my employer, and the highlights include I cannot stand or walk upright due to severe sciatic nerve pain in the back lumbar area. I can't straighten up while bearing weight at all due to the sciatic nerve pain, but I can, while hunched over, take small steps and move around, and I can sit fine. Sciatic stretching is the only thing that seemed to provide a little bit of relief. Moving on, day eight, December 27, 2018, I saw a chiropractor today. He did some adjustments and the back pain on the left side reduced, but it moved around and it moved more to the right side. And on the right side, I still have pain radiating up and down the sciatic nerve and numbness and circulation seems to be getting worse. Day nine, the next day, December 28th, found out the earliest I could get an MRI was January 8th. I've had numbness and loss of motor function, both my calves and feet going on nine days now. 
I was very concerned that waiting 11 more days to get the MRI done is way too long. And I was concerned that I would have potential, the potential for permanent nerve damage if I waited that long. I needed to find out exactly what was going on before then. Day 11, MRI, lumbar spine without contrast. And this was December 29th, 2018. So as I mentioned, I was having trouble getting an MRI scheduled. It was 11 days out. And I went to another doctor, made the case, and he ordered it stat after doing some arguing with him. Because uh, I said I was concerned that if we let this go longer, I'm going to experience, per I, I'm afraid that I might experience permanent um, muscle weakness and permanent numbness. So fortunately he ordered it and um, the next day I was able to get in and get the MRI and the MRI results are shown here below. So a couple highlights, uh, difficulty ambulating, that means I had trouble walking. And if we go down here, the highlights include L4, L5 nerve, nerve root. So at this level I had a posterior annular disc tear with a large posterior broad-based disc herniation into the spinal canal, resulting in severe spinal canal stenosis and severe mass effective compression of all visualized nerve roots at this level. Additionally, I had severe left neuroforminal stenosis and moderate right neuroforminal stenosis also seen at this level due to the broad-based disc herniation. So to take a look at this, the disc tear, annular disc tear, if you uh, research that, this takes a long time to heal, about a year and a half. So um, when that tore, I had the herniation which protruded into the spinal canal. So that was pressing against my nerve root. And anytime I moved the wrong way, uh, that would touch the nerve. And that was the, uh, the lightning uh, type pain that I've experienced. In my intro, I mentioned it took my breath away. So the whole time I was experiencing pain moving around, it was because that disc was touching into the nerve root. Um, additionally, and that's called spinal canal stenosis. Additionally, I had the nerve root actually got compressed, the pinched nerve, and that caused all the numbness and the muscle weakness that I experienced. So they, they refer to that as severe mass effective compression of all the visualized nerve roots, what they can see on the actual MRI. And then I also had, to a lesser extent here, the stenosis or that pressing of that disc into the spinal canal on the left side as well. And again, that was due to the same herniation, the broad-based disc herniation. Now, on the L5-S1, I also had the same posterior annular disc tear and a smaller, what they refer to as tiny central posterior disc herniation. Um, on both sides, or both parts of the nerve root, the L4, L5, I had the numbness, as well as L5-S1, I experienced numbness along those nerve roots, and the muscles that are activated by those nerves um, significantly were weakened and atrophied tremendously and to visualize that I have a diagram and this is, and this is courtesy of orthopedia.com this diagram visually shows the nerve roots where I experienced numbness running along those nerve roots as well as the resulting muscle weakness and muscle atrophy so looking at the L4, L5 first, you can see from the front view, the L4 travels up from the big toe, which I experienced numbness throughout all the toes, from the big toe running up the front of the leg and around the side of the, the upper leg and hip. And then L5 is more in the middle here, affecting the rest of these toes and running up and around the side of the leg. And on the back view, you can see the L4 affecting the bottom part of the big toe. And I was experiencing numbness underneath my foot and on top of it. And the L5, you can see, runs up and around, wraps around the calf. 
and up through the upper hip. So the other injury, the other um, having post annular disc tears and herniations on both levels, the S1 L5 nerve root affected more of the outside part. The S1 affected the outside part, the pinky toe, and I had um, noticed numbness on the outside, up and around the calf, and that um, as well wraps around the upper glutes here, as you can see. So this explains a lot of the um, muscle weakness that I experienced. As I mentioned, it was profound in my calves. I couldn't lift my heel off the floor. And additionally, my hamstring muscles um, affected by the S1 here and the L5, um, they atrophied and did not work. I had lost approximately 95% of my strength in being able to do hamstring curls. And then I had severe atrophy um, in the upper glute area, and that was due to the L5 S1. When I spoke about it, I tried to explain it. Um, I couldn't take steps out, and I explained this on the intro. And it felt like my hips were floating. That was one way I described it. And it also felt like I was walking in ski boots. Again, I couldn't feel any of my toes. I would say about 95% numbness. It was extreme numbness in the toes. I remember having considerable numbness on the outside part, um, kind of sporadic numbness through, through the nerve root here. And then, um, you know, parts of my calves, I could, I could touch my calves and, and, you know, feel that. But you could feel, literally feel the numbness kind of, it felt like it was inside, inside the calf and inside my, my hips going up and around. Day 12, scheduled surgery, December 31st, 2018. Surgery was scheduled for two days later, the day after New Year's, so... January 2nd, 2019, I ended up not going with surgery, but I wanted to highlight what type of surgery was recommended, what the risks are, and what the surgery consists of along with the considerations. So you can see here the recommended surgery was lumbar decompression with disectomy. And a couple things to note with this surgery is, um, number one, there are risks involved. I won't read these, but I'll, I'll zoom in so you can take a look and you can pause the video if you're interested and you can read through this. So that's one note. And then another note is, if you are looking at this surgery, there are newer techniques to make this more minimally evasive. And I'll go to a site courtesy of orthromanhattan.com where they discuss microdisectomy. So this is the minimally evasive version of what I was looking at. And again, the goal here is to decompress the nerve root and spinal cord, relieve symptoms, and enable the patient to return to regular activities of daily living. To accomplish this surgery, what they do is they actually remove uh, a portion of the disc here and you can see this is a quite a large portion and they give you a, a ruler here to show you it's approximately you know four and a half centimeters long and you can watch the video of the actual surgery here on YouTube a couple of things I want to point out if you look through the site you can see they talk about after surgery care and then after care at home I don't see um, anything that mentions rehab. I'm assuming they would do some sort of rehab to try to address the root cause of the problem and not just try to remove the disc to accomplish the decompression needed to recover from things that I suffered from, including numbness and muscle weakness. If we move along here and you take a look at um, what happens if you Google and do a little research on lumbar disectomy? Uh, you'll realize that there are some trade-offs to be aware of. One major trade-off is that when they remove that disc material from your spinal, from your your spinal canal, 
it requires them then to go ahead and fuse two or more of the vertebrae to stabilize the spine. And so this trade-off guarantees that you will lose some mobility. You're never going to go back to 100% uh, of how you were prior to the injury if you get this surgery. And for me, this is something that uh, I really didn't want to have as a trade-off. Additionally, I was concerned with the risk of surgery and concerned that the surgery, given the low percentage of people who recover, who, who find relief from numbness and muscle weakness, as per the other study, um, I, I was concerned that um, you know it didn't seem like a good option for me. So, um, additionally, I would like to point out that the surgery doesn't really address the root cause and this is how I look at it so um, going to this site here and it looks like it's pilates.collectivedenver.com um, they have some nice illustrations of what a normal spine looks like and keying in on this and I'm going to try and zoom in so you'll see on the left hand side we have an example of a normal looking man and I chose these diagrams to make or make a point or differentiate between the different types of backs that are commonly seen. So on the left hand side this is most closest to normal. You would have a good amount of curve in your lumbar area and the curvature is known as lordosis. Now if you want to be picky here Lordosis can often refer to having an over curvature of the back, and that's known as sway back. So here in the Cleveland Clinic, we can see that a normal posture has a good amount of lumbar curvature or lordosis versus someone who has too much, you can see um, that's sort of a, an indent here, an over curvature of the spine. So there's there can be cases where you can have too much, but that's commonly found in pregnant women and young growing children who eventually typically grow out of it. But aside from that, um, for individuals who sit a lot or blue collar workers who've worked hard their whole lives, the problem is that they don't have enough curvature. And um, down here, Cleveland, the Cleveland Clinic explains that lordosis is normal in cervical or the neck and the lumbar spine. In fact, the lumbar spine typically has 40 degrees of curvature. This is what I lost. When I looked at my back, I was like this guy in the middle here called flat back. I had no curve, straight down. And being an engineer, um, it's pretty obvious to me that if you take this guy on the left here and you make him into the flat back guy so you could put pressure here and push the um, vertebrae in and cause it to become flat like this guy when you do that you can see that it's going to create pressure tremendous amounts of force on in between the actual vertebrae here because pushing this in just compresses your spine. Your head, you don't grow taller. Um, what it does is it flattens it out and it, and it creates um, more force that has to compress your spine in order to fit that longer um, spine that's straightened versus the guy over here who has a curve and he has more slack in his spine. So that's where I got the idea of really attacking the McKenzie exercise which is designed to help and it helped me go from this flat back guy to this guy with a natural curve and less pressure and, and no pain. Furthermore I'd like to point out that if you get the disectomy where they remove the disc material from your vertebrae here it will create some space and that may relieve the pain and help reduce or eliminate the numbness and or muscle weakness. However, it doesn't address the root cause of the problem, which is the flat back. Recovery. 
Before I get into how I made a recovery and what I did to fully recover 100%, I'd like to point out that it was not an overnight process. The healing of nerves, the return, um, the healing from numbness, and then the healing from the muscle weakness is a very long, slow process. To illustrate that, um, this was day 51, February 8th, 2019. So at this point, I had no indication of any type of improvement, either in the numbness and or the muscle weakness. The atrophy continued to get worse, and I continued to see no improvement all the way up until day 105. So um, the reason I point out this is on day 51, I actually applied for a permanent disability parking placard and I did this because I couldn't take and I think it's a required um, you, you qualify for this if you can't walk 200 feet I think it is um, and I, I couldn't even walk probably more than 50 feet and that would be with a cane with very slowly with small labored steps. So I just want to point out this. At this point in time, I really had almost lost hope, but I continued to do the rehab that I'll go over here in a minute. And this would be day 105. So on day 105 was a tremendous day for me. It was the first day that I had been able to move my little toe far enough to overlap it. So for me, I was trying to think of a way to gauge improvement and the numbness, you just can't, it's, it's so subjective, you can't tell if that's coming back or not. And so the easiest way was to, to measure how far I could move my little toe. So I could move it up and down a little bit, I could, but I didn't have the ability to move it up and over to the side. And day 105 was the first concrete evidence that I had that I was getting any type of improvement. And then one last thing, this book that I re recommend reading is by Dr. John Sarno, uh, Healing Back Pain TMS. And Dr. John Sarno has um, many decades worth of experience and he tackles back pain and it's an interesting read from the perspective that a lot of people's back pain is caused by repressed emotions. So. That for me was one part of the, the root cause that um, led up to the physical symptoms that I experienced. So the symptoms and the injury are real, but it does help to be aware of this and maybe you can prevent getting into a situation such as I experienced just by dealing with things from the emotional side. So a very good read. Another thing that I picked up an important point out of this book, it was important for me, was that um, he didn't really believe in traction beds. He felt that your your spine is very strong and that pulling it apart, decompressing it, it's really not going to do anything because it's so strong you can't really, um, you can't really separate it at all. And that point was important for me because when, um, when I went to a chiropractor, so initially I went to a local chiropractor and they wanted to do the traditional chiropractor uh, twist and crack type routine and I actually felt that that made things worse and that to me was silly. I wanted to address the root cause of the problem. Again, I believed it was because my back became flat and then it increased the pressure on the lower part of the, the vertebrae, specifically the L4, L5 and the S1, L5. and given the fact that uh, Dr. Sarno mentioned that you know your spine is very strong and I did um, one thing I will point out at the chiropractor one thing I did like is he had a traction bed and when I got onto that I felt like that decompression felt very good and I wanted more of that it just didn't the uh, I forget what the pounds that it went up to I had them do it on a max and it wouldn't go any higher for me and I felt like I needed more so what I did here, and this is a video uh, under my playlist for rehab, how I made a 100% recovery. The biggest thing that I attributed to 
would be doing what was what is known as the McKenzie exercise, and that would be the arching movement. Um, but unfortunately, my back was too straight, and I was in too much pain. And then with the herniated disc protruding into my spine, it just it was impossible. But one way I was able to do that was by decompressing my back first, and at the same time, then I was able to do sort of like a modified version of the McKenzie. Um, you know, so um, essentially, what I did is I bought 100-pound bands tied them to my ankle, secured it to a door, crawled out, which caused my back to decompress. And that was enough for me to be able to do sort of the McKenzie where I arch my back. So let me go ahead and play this. What I'm doing here is I'm stretching out on the floor. I have the 100 pound bands tied to the door and I'm decompressing my back. So I'm doing this because, again, I had a fully compressed nerve root and I was unable to do this critical McKenzie method needed to alleviate my pain. I was unable to do that on the floor unassisted. So by decompressing my back, I was able to get to the point of where I could actually start making progress and in increasing the critical lordosis that I needed or the curvature of the back to get back to a normal state of 40 to 60 degrees of curvature. When you're doing this, if you if you have a compressed nerve root or a pinched nerve and you need to alleviate it and you're in the same position I am, what I would recommend is crawling out here until you start feeling tension. Don't just skip by it and pull yourself all the way out. But when you feel the ten tension, stay right in that position and in, until it starts relieving. What you'll notice is you might be really tight and then you'll stay there for a minute and then it'll alleviate and then you'll be able to crawl out further and further and keep doing that until you can get to the point of where you can um, you're able to lift yourself off the ground like I was doing there to begin the McKenzie without pain and then work on that I actually had to do this process for about three months um, before I was able to go ahead and actually do the bar hang where you decompress and then get on the floor and do the McKenzie unassisted. So skipping ahead to the bar hang, so if you're able to do this without the bands, then you can go ahead and um, get a get a hanging bar like I have. And a couple things I want to point out, if I back up here for a second, when you grab the bar, you want to make sure you use an overhand grip where your palms are holding the weight, not your fingers. If you do the fingers, you, you could hurt your finger, the tendons in your finger, and that would cause you pain. And then the other thing with that is you want to make sure your hands are closer together. If you have a bar where you have to grab further apart, you're not going to be able to drop your pelvis. So that's pretty critical to get your hands close together. And then the other critical part would be to use your feet. Your feet have to be on the floor so you can control the weight. You don't want to just drop down uh, with a tight back and then you'll end up pulling something. So you want to grab the bar and gently um, control the pain. And then again, just like on the floor, once you feel any kind of stiffness or tightness, stay with it and then eventually it should release and you'll be able to drop further and further until you can hang there like I am with your toes on the floor and then eventually you can uh, hang free hang without your toes so what I'm doing here is I'm feeling for any kind of pain and I'm pretty loose here so that I can almost right now I'm pretty much free hanging and I'm rocking back and forth and what that does is that allows um, you to put a little pressure there while you're hanging to further try to release your pelvis and drop your pelvis um, another thing technique that I use while doing this is um, breathing. So taking deep breaths in and out is another way to um, force more decompression onto your back while you're hanging. So once you feel like you're not tight here and you feel some relief as far as the decompression on, on the bar, then you can go ahead and immediately get on the floor and then start to do the McKenzie method, the McKenzie exercise. So a couple points here, um, your legs are heavy, so you wanna be on, a, it helps to be on a carpet, not something slippery when you wanna have some friction. And when I do this, I'll gently pull myself forward to get a little bit of decompression as I do the up and down motion of the McKenzie. 
The other key point is to keep your pelvis on the floor. If your pelvis is lifting off, you're not gaining the benefits from it. Again, when you have um, issues in the L4, L5, or the L5, S1 nerve root, um, it's the lower lumbar area. So we want to increase that, that lordosis in that area, that curvature in that area. And you can see I'm going up pretty high, so I have a pretty good amount of curvature. If you have back problems, you probably won't be able to get anywhere near this, and you want to work your way up until you can get uh, almost your arms fully extended. Another thing I want to point out is, in addition to that, uh, so I did the the um, again I did the bar the um, bands on the floor for about the first three three and a half months before I was able to even do the bar hang and Mackenzie unassisted without the bands. So that's how bad of shape I was in, and that gives you a little bit of idea how long it takes to to increase that natural curvature to get to that natural 40 per, to 60 percent curve in the spine. When you get to that um, point of where you're starting to get that natural curve, you'll you'll feel a tremendous release a relief in um, the amount of pain. So you'll you start to feel pain reduction day over day by day. It was a little bit every day. And um, you'll also, in my case, um, then if you have numbness, that takes a lot longer to come back. So that can take a few months. And so that's just something you'll just have to wait for. Um, I, again, I had 105 days before I noticed any type of even the littlest improvement in the um, ability to move my muscles, um, let alone the numbness, which is subjective. And it's really hard to tell when that comes back. So just keep doing this. Um, I would do the McKenzie exercise in the beginning. I was probably doing it six to ten times a day, like every hour. And then after that, after a month or two, I started doing it like two or three times a day. And I would do it heavily at night. Again, your back can get a little bit sore from doing this because you're, you're going from a, a flat state and you're putting that curve back in. Um, but again, usually if you sleep on it overnight, um, that little bit of... Um, arching pain that you get from trying to uh, aggressively at, uh, reverse years and years of the opposite type movement that caused it, the, the straight back, the flat back. Uh, to reverse that, you're, you're going to go through a little bit of pain. So if we go to recovery steps part two, this is the video on where I, I talk about the GHD machine and so what I want to point out on the machine if we skip ahead to where I'm hanging down here uh, so I'll back up just a little bit so initially I'll hang down there so I'm actually doing this while I'm making the video because it feels good so if you think about the McKenzie you're going up and down this is really just a modified version of that. So we're decompressing in a different, um, with, with our back curved here. And this feels really good because again, you're decompressing, you're getting that, that, um, that compression, you're, you're getting that relief from the decompression, from um, pulling your, your pelvis away from your spine a little bit. And so you can do this. I was able to do this early on. I didn't have the machine right away. And that's why I made the makeshift video. So let me skip ahead to that. If we go ahead to the makeshift front view vi video, I'll explain why I made this video and um, the benefits that it pro provided me. So if we scroll ahead here to right about here. So the beginning part um, we can ignore for now. That's a more advanced movement, and I'll come back to that in a second. That's the Nordic type exercise. But um, what I'm doing here is I'm actually doing the same thing that we saw on the GHD machine. I'm doing a modified version. So when I was in pain, um, I tried all kinds of stretching. I went on YouTube and, and tried everything initially, and it just caused me more pain. You cannot stretch a herniated disc that's protruding into your spinal cord. You can't stretch that away. Um, you have to address the root cause of the problem, and in my case, it was a lack of uh, lordosis or curvature in my spine. So what I'm doing here is I have my body about half off of this ottoman. 
and I'm still doing the Nordic here, so let me skip ahead a little further. So right here. So at this point, I have my body half off. Um, you could see, so the end of the ottoman, there's probably about eight inches or 10 inches between my hips and, and that. And what I'm doing is I'm decompressing. So you can move around on this to find the right spot. But essentially, uh, you'll be able to uh, use your hands to pull yourself forward and you have gravity pulling down. And this decompresses the spine differently than the McKenzie so that um, when you're bar hanging, you decompress. And then when you're on the floor, you have a little bit of decompression as you pull yourself forward. Um, but here, you're doing the same thing. You're going to pull yourself forward and, and you're using gravity to decompress your body at the same time and it allows you to move up and down in a very similar fashion to the McKenzie. The benefit of this is you're going through range of motion and you're really teaching your spine how to move again um, without being in a compressed state. So if you have back pain you have a compressed state. Um, if you have if you're really bad where you have a, a disc protruding like I did or a, a compressed nerve root um, this will feel really good and so what I do here is um, I lay off of it where I'm in that decompressed state and then I'm simply moving up and down and this is very similar to the GHD machine and this is what I did for months before I, I bought the GHD machine and this is what gave me the idea that hey I, I need to try this machine it looks like this would be a, a better version of what I'm doing here on the makeshift so if you have the machine or you've access to a, a gym a facility that has that go ahead and um, go to that first but you can always do get a couch and an ottoman and and be able to do this on your own so the makeshift nordic with couch side view video this shows you the same video just from a side view and the thing i want to point out here is how i secure my feet so if you look at my feet here i slide them a little bit underneath the couch and i'll actually use the toes to secure myself in place and this allows me to hold myself and perform things like the Nordic. So um, you do need a little bit of support if you're doing that GHD movement off the ottoman like I was showing you before and that's what I want to point out. Now if we take a look at the Nordic exercise this is something you don't want to do early on. This is something you want to do after you get that natural curve in your spine and you're pain free and you've built up your glutes doing the uh, glute ham developer type exercises and some of the other exercises that I'll show you a little bit later on. Um, but to address the Nordic exercise, this is something I did um, maybe toward um, month 10. Um, once I started feeling pretty good and strong with my back and I had the nice curvature, um, I, I went ahead and bought the uh, the Nordic bench. Um, after watching the knees over toes guy, um, I got the idea that, hey, I want to address my hamstring issues because I still had some sciatic pain and I felt like it had something to do with the, um, the ham. I knew it had something to do with the hamstring pull that I had five years earlier. And um, I've had previous pulls before that and I've always suffered from tightness in my hamstrings. Even while I was walking, I could always feel it. When I would go ahead and play um, baseball, I would have to warm up for like a, quite a long time before I could go ahead and sprint. And so um, I tried doing this uh, exercise and I, I first started doing it on the couch here and to demonstrate here, and this is the same position I used to uh, finish with the, the GHD. So the other point I wanted to make was the knees. Um, so yeah, uh, I have the knees here right on the end of the ottoman and that's probably why I'm only hanging uh, halfway off. Um, I guess ideally, if you're doing the GHD movement at, that I showed at the end, you could probably want to get your hips closer to the end, um, but I just didn't have a high enough ottoman, so I just did what I could with what I had. Um, but going back to the Nordic ex exercise, so um, the key benefits to this is it really completely healed my hamstring issues um, to the point of where I can basically go out and do a flat out all uh, flat out sprint and feel no pain and it feels great even without warming up. Now I still warm up a little bit, but I, I not nearly. You know, I just do it more out of caution. But you know, generally speaking, uh, I'm always ready to go. So 
What I found is um, a lot of the sciatic pain that I had previous to the injury, just that nagging pain that would show up when I was sitting too long, driving in a car, um, that completely went away after doing this for a year, along with the GHD machine, both the front uh, sit-ups with the, for the hip flexors, and then the, um, the what I just showed, the reverse sit-ups there where you're working on uh, stretching and then developing the upper glutes. So uh, this exercise, um, and I'll go ahead and play it here, on the makeshift. Um, so in the beginning, um, you have to use your hands and or a ball or something to support, and you really have to ease into this. This puts a lot of strain on your back, and if you're not strong, you can easily throw your back out doing this. So it's something not to avoid, just be smart. You can see I'm putting my hands down there a little bit to control. and But over time, um, initially you first start off um, just doing negatives. So just go down. Don't even try to go back up uh, unassisted. Just go down and then try to fight it as you go down. And that's a good way to ease into it until you get strong enough to be able to start going the other way. And I would recommend if you want to do this, um, look at the Knees Over Toes Guy channel. He has a, a lot of good videos and he's an expert in this. Um, so again, after doing this for about a year, I noticed the sciatic pain um, slowly went away. Uh, one thing with tendons, they take a lot longer to heal than muscles. So um, just this is something you can do daily and you just take your time in doing this and you'll notice tremendous benefits from the, um, the sciatic type pain perspective. As I mentioned earlier in my video, I did a lot of things. Um, I attacked this problem of my back pain from all different angles and I wanted to just get rid of it and then I wanted to bulletproof myself so this never ever ever happened again. You know, when you can't walk, when you're crippled, uh, it really changes your perspective. Um, I appreciate the ability to stand without pain now. I remember what it's like to have that building uh, spinal stenosis pain that would just build and build and build until you sat down. And that never went away um, initially. And that's something that a lot of people live with. And you know, that's why I'm, one of the reasons why I'm making this video is to show people that, hey, you know, I recovered and, you know, th there may be ways, things you can do. If you try these exercises, maybe you'll experience the same thing. Now, uh, to be fair, I did a lot of other things here. Um, I think what I covered so far, though, really addressed about 99% of it. Um, but I think strength training and nutrition does play a role. Um, so it's important to it's really important if you want to um, prevent future injury to understand some of the things you can do that will make your um, back resilient and um, free. Uh, it'll free you from the fear of lifting things up and the fear of doing things, and also give you confidence that hey, you know, you know, you're not going to get injured again. Um, you don't have to worry. So um, some things I did. Um, I want to point out first. Um, this uh, and it, this was from I learned about this from knees knees over toes guy as well. It's called monkey feet, and this is a device here. And I'll bring up a picture of it. But this was um, one of the key things. So my uh, hamstrings completely atrophied, my glutes and my calves. So the um, the calves um, they came back. That's pretty easy. Uh, I, I was I'm a jogger. I started jogging every day. So I literally jogged almost every single day for the first two years and then I still jog five to six times a week and I run with my foot forward and maybe I'll make a video on that as far as jogging um, the benefits to doing that but um, that uh, running with your foot forward puts a lot of um, emphasis on your calf muscle so it, they came back very quickly once the um, once I was able to move them again and the feeling came back and the movement came back then um, the jogging quickly rebuilt those but the hamstrings and the glutes, um, I really had to tackle independently. And one of the things I found that worked really good for the hamstrings was this device called a monkey feet. And basically, it's kind of like a ski boot. Uh, you put this on your, your foot, and then you strap yourself in. And uh, on the bottom, it latches, it attaches to like a dumbbell. So uh, it allows you to do things such as curls with a dumbbell uh, by leaning over. And, and very similar to a bicep curl. It allows you to do curls 
um, one-legged curls with a dumbbell so you can control the range of motion you can control the speed uh, I do have a hamstring um, bench where you lay down and do curls and I didn't really get it near as much benefit from that um, that wasn't working all the muscles that had atrophied very well and so to speed up the, the process I um, did a pretty diligently uh, I worked on um, doing individual curls with this and this really um, was able to build my hamstring muscles to make those strong so I highly recommend doing this um, if you um, you don't want to you have a need to build your hamstring muscles and it's just a good overall exercise um, the uh, the reverse of that so I also use it for the hip flexors so I know some of the people out there think that um, if your hip flexors get too strong that could be bad for your back um, I disagree so I worked on building the, my glutes with the GHD, but at the same time, um, I want my pelvis to sit tight against my spine. I don't want it dropping um, randomly or, or be loose because when it does drop, I notice that's when you're really at risk because you can really throw your back out. So once you have your back, the curvature um, in the correct position, um, you no longer uh, need to really pull it apart. You decompress a little bit, the bar hangs are fine. But um, what you want is you want to have the hip flexors and the glutes both um, working in balance and keeping your pelvis uh, tight with your spine so that you don't accidentally have that, you know, separate and then you throw your back out. So uh, working on, I work pretty heavily on the hip flexors. It's also obviously ex excellent for things such as sprinting, you know, so I'm an athlete and I want to be fast and that's another reason why I do it. But doing this in conjunction with the back, I noticed really secured my pelvis and it makes me feel very confident in doing just about anything now. Um, building glutes, another thing I did and I started doing this um, pretty early. So once, um, once the numbness went away and my muscles started working again, my glutes were completely flat. It was just horrible. As I mentioned in my intro video, I couldn't even wear pants even with a belt. They just wouldn't stay up. So one of the best ways you can start building your glutes in addition to the, um, the GHD, which seems to work more the upper glutes, um, and this will work more the, the middle and the lower glutes, is doing these uh, single leg um, hip thrusters. So um, you start off um, with no way. It's pretty hard to do it. And if you, um, if you haven't worked your glutes at all, you don't target those, you're probably very weak and you probably can't even feel the muscles in there. So when you do this exercise, it's very important to make a mind-muscle connection with your glutes. So you have to actually have to isolate those. So you're using the glutes to push yourself up. One thing that helps is if you push through the heel here when you're doing these up and down motion and you have the other leg straight out. And like all other exercises, you want to progress into it. So what I did was I worked my way up to about 20 reps, and then I started doing it with weight. And I keep the, the rep range pretty high, and I just go until it burns pretty good, and then I, I switch, and I'll do two or three sets. And I'll do those um, like twice a week. It's not something you have to overwork, but it's something you want to um, work on if you want to build your glutes and make everything strong. Um, I think basically doing strength training too, um, getting all the muscles um, strong is important. Um, you want, obviously, it helps to have a very strong core and one of the best ways you can do that is to do compound exercises. So some of the stuff that I do, um, and I have videos on here, and for someone who had such a, a terrible back injury, it's um, I think it's pretty cool that I can do a lot of this stuff. So. I do heavy bent over barbell rows. Um, this is something, again, if you have back problems, you got to ease into it. Now, you have to have a strong back to do this. So anything you start doing, start doing it very light, high reps, and very slowly work your way up and be smart about it. Once you get strong, though, then um, don't be afraid to push it. Um, I, I go heavy now, and I push everything as much as I can. I feel like if I did have a, a slip up, where you know like um, maybe I, I deadlifted wrong or something and I have once or twice over the last couple of years um, it's something I can work out of like it, it lasts for a day or two and I'm able to reverse it very quickly or address it so I'm not really worried about hurting myself again 
Um, I feel like you hurt yourself when you let muscles go and you don't work on things. And then like, I, I feel like my pelvis got loose and that put me at risk. So um, being in shape really is the key to preventing injury. So bed over rows, a compound exercise. Um, another one I do obviously well known is just a bench press upper body. Not really pertinent to this video as much, but um, just addressing all the different areas of the body. Uh, chin ups, I do these heavy too as well. So uh, again, um, this is kind of a great exercise, even if you have back problems, it's, it de decompresses you while you're doing it. So you're building strength uh, through your core and you're also getting a decompression at the same time. Um, deadlifts, uh, I feel like you shouldn't be afraid of doing deadlifts. I know a lot of people are afraid, um, thinking that you know it's a terrible exercise, you know, dangerous for your back. I've been able to do these and I, I feel like there's a good benefit for your glutes and your hamstrings um, if you do these right. So um, by right mean, meaning uh, right for what you need. Um, I do deadlifts, I pick up the weight, I don't just drop it. I like to control it on the way down because I feel a lot of the benefit is on the way down where you can really feel it in your glute and your hamstrings. So um, that's one, one tip I would give you. But again, you got to be smart. You got to get strong slowly and work your way up. And then once you're strong, you can really go aggressive at it and uh, really have fun with it. Um, other things I do very quickly, you know, weighted dips, um, upper body, hang cleans. This is very good for your upper back. So not just doing cleans. I do cleans for explosiveness. Um, again, I'm an athlete, but I also find that um, putting the straps on and then when you clean the weight, when you let it down, it puts a lot of, um, it really works your upper back and it builds up things like your traps and stuff. I've had shoulder problems. So this is one of the ways um, I was able to um, kind of um, build up my traps again and let my shoulders and everything sit properly and I've had issues with that so it's, I think it's a great exercise and again all these compound exercises build uh, a solid foundation too that makes you resilient and that's kind of the point um, when I do uh, bent over rows um, I'll do that in combination with uh, bench press but I try to match uh, push and pull exercises it's pretty common in um, the weightlifting communities. So typically I'll do deadlifts and then um, I might do a, a pull exercise and then I'll do an overhead push exercise. Here I do overhead like military style presses and then I'll do finish with the push press where you squat and press. And then um, another one I like to do is the pullover. So um, this is great for baseball players but um, upper body and I go down kind of straight arm and then I really work it works your whole upper body and it hits your triceps really differently than uh, dips or any other tricep exercise so some other things I like to point out so in addition to the stretching I mentioned with the uh, GHD machine and the bar hangs etc um, a couple of things that um, I like to do I think I, I feel like I felt a lot of uh, value out of doing split stretching one thing I want to point out is when you're doing stretching, and again, knees over toes guy mentions stretching uh, under load, under with tension. Um, when you're doing stretching, static stretching with no load, I think is really dangerous. I, I don't think it's uh, beneficial at all. You're just kind of like stretching the tendons. You want to build them so that they get stronger, and that's really what heals. I, I've had rotator cuff injuries. I had a lot of different tendon injuries, and I've learned that... Um, doing range of motion under load with them and you have to be smart about it but you can progressively get the tendons stronger and that's really where they heal and that was really that's really evident with the nordic exercise as well so you have the tendons under load when you're moving up and down uh, very important so um uh, i'll do things such as like the middle split so here i'm holding my uh, palms on the floor um, controlling the weight but putting a good amount of weight while I'm doing the stretching and I'll actually push up from my feet to try to keep the tension uh, keep some load while I'm doing the stretching so that's one thing 
Um, I'll do the other type of split, the um, the side split as well, the same way. That maybe you would do with like a, a couch and an ottoman on either side, and you hold that with your hands, and then you work on doing the stretch until you feel it. And then when you feel it, you try to push the opposite way to create a load on it and then hold it and do some isometric holds like that. And that's really how you'll gain benefit in, in healing. Um, stretching the hip flexors, obviously anything you're working, you want to constantly um, stretch those muscles. Again, using load here, I'm supporting myself on my front foot here. So just to give you an idea of stretching under load. And then cardio and nutrition. So this is something I did. If you remember, I mentioned, well, I didn't mention this video, but on my intro video, um, I mentioned that my feet were ice cold. Uh, I might have mentioned in this video too. So um, when I crushed the nerve root and I had the numbness, I also had a lack of oxygen, and I knew I had to increase circulation. That was really important. So um, once I was able to walk on the treadmill and start walking more, I got to the point where I could walk outside and then I regressed to a very slow jog and then I kept jogging. And um, when, when you can't stand without pain and you can't walk without a cane, um, it does put a different perspective on life. And so I really appreciate the fact that I could run, regardless of how much pain I was in initially, um, it was just great to be able to do that. And I've never been a runner, so um, I kept running. I was watching David Goggins for motivation. Um, he was someone who, who talked about weight loss. He weighed 300 pounds and then he um, started running because he hates running. Um, he talked about mental toughness. And when you have an injury like this, like I did with this crippling back pain and um, the numbness and muscle loss and muscle weakness, um, being mentally tough was important. I mentioned the TMS book, Tension Myositis Syndrome. So that has a lot to do with, um, in, in my opinion, um, the same thing David Goggins was talking about. Um, don't run away from your problems. Um, you know, go right toward them. Whatever you're hiding from, if you bring it to light, that'll help you deal with it. And then that will give your body some pain relief. Um, because um, according to the book, and I do agree with it, um, your body can protect you by uh, restricting oxygen and causing pain in different areas. So that is a real phenomenon, something to be aware of. And um, when you're working through any kind of uh, dehabilitating injury, um, not being depressed, being positive is important. So um, working on your mental toughness is definitely something that helps you overcome the fear. And I think that's a, an important part of dealing with back pain. Too many people, um, they end up living in fear and then they stop moving and that's one of the worst things you can do and that'll cause the pain to get worse over time and it causes you to be weaker uh, that's one of the reasons why i lift without a belt um, i don't i deadlift etc i don't wear a belt because i want my back to be strong and to be able to do things i don't want to be um, not able to move a certain way and then be worried that it's gonna i'm gonna throw my back out again um, a lot of people who have um, back problems, it's due to obesity. Obesity is a huge problem in the U.S. and, and worldwide even. And so I wanted to point out a couple things that I learned because um, I had some significant changes in my body composition since I started running and started really attacking um, weightlifting and rehab with um, using mental toughness. and. What I learned is um, a couple things. So let me go ahead and open this up. So just to show you a couple pictures here, and I sorry I don't have a before picture, but I can tell you um, early in 2018 before the injury, I had a 38-inch um, waist, and I lost 6 inches off of my belly. So I lost a considerable amount of belly fat down to 32. And... Um, how I did that was changing my nutrition. That was the biggest part. Uh, in addition to adding cardio, uh, I always used to lift weights a little bit, but um, um, the uh, I never did cardio, and my um, nutrition was bad. Just because, and I didn't realize how bad it is. And the biggest cause of belly fat and obesity really is the amount of intake of refined sugar. The food processing industry 
they put sugar because it's addictive into everything. If you start looking at things, you look at cereal, it has 12 grams of added sugar. Take a look at what that looks like, like the amount of sugar you're taking in, and then do a little research on what it causes. It causes problems with insulin resistance. Um, it doesn't digest well, it causes inflammation. So it, it increases a, a percent of inflammation across everything. So if you have shoulder problems or back problems or anything, it's going to make the um, that problem worse. So when I was in so much pain, I don't like taking pain medication. I don't take anything. I'm not on any, any medications. And um, you know, for me, it was critical to do everything I could. I want to increase circulation and I wanted to make my body as healthy as possible to give myself the best chance of recovering. And so cleaning up my diet was a big thing. Um, I'll just show you a couple more pictures before I go into the nu nutrition part. But um, you know, my goal wasn't to get into like this kind of shape. It just happened because of you know, the, the uh, David Goggins approach of attacking um, whatever you're worried about. So and then uh, looking to push yourself beyond what you think is your limit. He mentions he think a lot of people think that they reach 100% of their effort. And in reality, at, at best, they're hitting 80% and probably more likely 60%. And that's true. And I kind of applied that to running. So I ran every day about a mile to usually about a mile and a half to two miles and never really, never over three. So I kept it usually almost always around two or less. And but uh, when I would get winded, I would uh, not when I thought I would hit it 100%. Um, toward the end so I would do a slow jog and then toward the end uh, I'm still pretty winded because I was really out of shape and then uh, even from the, the beginning even when I was in pain I would I would try to sprint at the end so at the end I would try to sprint the last 10 seconds or so um, almost 100 meters and um, you know I thought I was gonna die the first couple times I tried to do that and it was painful and um, it hurt bad but um, I noticed that um, as I did that, then the fear kind of went away. So my body wasn't, my brain wasn't so quick to say, hey, stop. It was actually letting, felt like it was letting me make the decisions on when, when, when to stop. It wasn't fear-based. So that, that was a kind of a big breakthrough. And I applied that to everything I did, uh, the intensity of training. And uh, really that's where it's at. Um, to get in this kind of shape, it just takes good nutrition. And um, I, I did lift um, a little bit every day, but I would say between like 15, 20 minutes, um, n not much more than 30 minutes usually ever. And but I, I would, I have a gym in my basement, so I could go down and work out like um, you know five or 10 minutes here and there. So I would do that like three or four times a day. I would go down and then uh, do a couple sets, really intense, and then um, I would let it go. And I just kept doing that, and but I ran every day. I tried to run every morning. <clears throat> Running on an empty stomach when you first get up um, is a lot easier than having food. And I also implemented um, uh, in intermittent fasting. So I didn't eat right away. I would skip breakfast and try to delay eating until I was really hungry. And um, I'll explain a little bit of that when I get into the nutrition. Uh, one more photo here, like the uh, the uh, if you do compounds and you attack those. Um, you know, I, I put on a considerable amount of muscle, um, and that wasn't really my goal. My goal is athletic performance and to be have balance there. But I just want to give a couple pictures here for motivation. But as far as um, if you're heavy and you need to lose weight, you can't do sit-ups. I didn't do any sit-ups to get the the abs, for example, that I got. Um, if you're losing body fat, you're gonna have to change your diet and then do some cardio as uh, strength training helps a lot too. building muscle helps you burn fat quicker um, but cutting out the added sugar is the biggest thing so look at everything I even look at little things I don't even use ketchup for example with sugar like everything if you cut it out the sugar cravings will go away um, now I don't I do a high protein, low carb diet, but not really low carb. And I, I don't cut out sugar per se. I just cut out added or refined sugar, including fr high fructose. Um, and I get my sugar from natural sur sources such as fruits. So here, um, this is an example of something I do every day. So I, I 
blend up raw foods and I chose these because blueberry these are superfoods and um, in my opinion the, the blueberries and avocado especially are the two best things you can eat you should try to incorporate things like that into your diet um, immediately if you're not uh, blueberries help in, in, increase circulation and have a lot of antioxidants um, they, they help you um, they help keep you from getting sick. It build, builds your immune system, and uh, you sleep less. Uh, you have better energy, more sustained energy. It's just so much better. So, um, and it's not just blueberries. You can supplement these with. Um, so I'll, I'll always um, have between usually a cup or more of blueberries every day. So I'm getting a lot of um, a lot of my sugar naturally from this, and um, the avocados for the fats. But the blueberries, you can uh, add strawberries, um, blackberries, raspberries, any kind of colored berries are very good for you. And then I just chose the kale. You could substitute spinach or something just to have some sort of green. Um, I chose kale because it has the, uh, it's technically the most dense, nutrient dense uh, green. But uh, really, I tried spinach before. And spinach, even though I like it in salads and stuff, it, it's. Uh, it kind of ruins the taste here, so this is actually tastes the best if you uh, get the, the proportions down right. And then um, I have pineapples I mentioned here in the video to offset the kale. Um, two other things that I uh, highly recommend adding: uh, ginger ginger root. You buy the root and cut little pieces and start eating that every day. You can blend that up. And uh, turmeric. Turmeric's uh, good for uh, countering inflammation, so it really works. Um, you just have to make sure that you um, get something that has fats like the avocado and that'll make it more bioavailable. Um, not getting sick is huge because um, the one thing I was really concerned with was having to take antibiotics all the time when I used to get sick. And I actually started doing this about eight years ago, nine years ago. And um, I used to get sick twice a year. And once I started doing this, um, my health improved a lot just from doing that not doing anything else really um, But I didn't get sick anymore So it really made a huge difference and I hadn't had to take an antibiotic in, in over nine years The antibiotics ruin your gut bacteria and that's something you need For a good health to be able to digest and, and to be able to be healthy. So that's just one thing I want to point out um, but again, if you cut out the added sugar and you add some cardio, you'll be surprised at how quickly you get um, you start losing that body fat. And, and being overweight puts a lot of stress on your back, so it's uh, critical not only from a health perspective, but you know for back pain, you want to lose that extra weight. I'll finish with a video. This was last year. Um, I was just fooling around here and. I am completely pain free now. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you know of anybody who has back pain, please share this video. It may be a lifesaver for them. Thank you.